about insulin resistance being dominant in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Don't have any disclosures for this. Uh, before I start my slides, my disclaimer is that I am not going to talk about insulin resistance and beta cell defect after diabetes has occurred. Whatever I am going to talk about is a run up to the pathogenesis and what happens before diabetes actually sets in. Because we are not here to discuss the relative contributions of either after type 2 diabetes has occurred. So the agenda would be what are the events preceding diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and what do we know so far. Modifiable elements, if any, to my mind, should be what is dominant in the pathogenesis because there is something you can do about it. And the clincher is, can we prevent diabetes despite a beta cell defect? And that should tell you probably what is more dominant, at least in some percentage of patients. If it is doable for some, it is probably doable for all. So let's see what happens in the events preceding the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and by how many years it can precede the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So what you have here is the cascade of events that happens, the role of obesity and the environment and the role of genes. So this is what we are going to discuss in short before we go on to decide what is more dominant. Now as we all know, Basically, disruption of the normal relationship between the beta cell function and insulin sensitivity is central to the pathogenesis. There is no doubt at all that both coexist. How much is the question? So, this is not diabetes. This is the run-up to diabetes, the stage 1, where I have shown you where there is very early insulin resistance, where you could find that the insulin and pro-insulin levels could be normal. The aliponectin could just be slightly dipping and you all know that aliponectin is one which confers insulin sensitivity on a person. So this is what happens years and years before type 2 diabetes actually sets in. In the stage 2, what you see in the yellow, aliponectin dips down even further. Mind you, there is no dysglycemia at this point of time. The insulin levels could be normal or could be increased and same is the case with pro-insulin. Or they could have, they, they could just be in a straight line or they could be more. And what happens ultimately is that aliponectin in the final stage just preceding, that is when the beta cell function starts coming in and then you have full-blown insulin resistance and then you have the type 2 diabetes diagnosis. So, as you can see here in one slide, what you find here and what is important to my mind is that both of these things probably yes, but as you can see that unless insulin resistance rises, there is no role for the beta cell to start compensating in the first place. So what you have here is that this insulin resistance which is there, this is the culprit which actually goes on increasing. Mind you, after type 2 diabetes is set in, yes, it is at a steady level, but even that can be brought down. But the inexorable progression of beta cell dysfunction, there is nothing you can do about it. When there is nothing you can do about anything, how can you call it dominant? It's a passive process, it just keeps on happening. But what is dominant, what is in your hand is what you can do. And what you can do is something about the insulin resistance. And it is a well-known fact that up to 92% of people with type 2 diabetes have insulin resistance. It precedes the diagnosis by 12 years and then it remains fairly constant which is okay. So this is the natural history, again the same thing which shows you what happens to the levels of beta cell and insulin levels. And if you see this, you can see here that the major defect in insulin resistance is already present at the onset of diabetes, not only at the onset, years and years and years before. Insulin sensitivity is influenced by a number of different factors such as genetics, age, acute exercise, physical fitness, dietary nutrients, medication, obesity, body fat distribution. Look at the number of factors that can influence insulin resistance. There is something you can do about it. Mind you, my debate here is not about what came first. That is not important. What came first, what came second, there is data to prove everything or disprove everything. What we are discussing here is what is dominant. And I, to 
my mind, it all begins this way. It all begins with fact. As you can see here, here you have lean and here you have an obese person. There is crosstalk because you have macrophage derived factors, you have adipocytokines and you have pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this is where the trouble begins and this leads to insulin resistance. So, as you can see in all the pathogenesis up to diabetes, you can see that it all begins with obesity, giving rise to insulin resistance and then the metabolic syndrome and the dyslipidemia, etc. So, the starting point is somewhere here, as you can see. So, this, all of you, uh, this August audience is very, very familiar with the thrifty genotype, the thrifty phenotype, we know the intrauterine factors. I'm not going to go into the details of how this happens because that will take a long time. But fetal adaptive responses are there, epigenetic mechanisms are there for insulin resistance. Again, as I said, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but the result of all this adaptation in utero is alterations in the insulin sensitivity and behavioral changes that include hyperphagia which persists even later on and that leads to more insulin resistance and all this programming leads to the metabolic syndrome phenotype in adult life which is nothing but insulin resistance and all of you know this this happens even this is happening even in india the portions have grown it's all behavior behavior leading to more and more insulin resistance even the breakthroughs Look at reducing insulin resistance. This is just an example prototype of new treatment for insulin resistance. These are the genes. You have genes for obesity, you have for beta cell, you have for insulin resistance. So there's genes for everything. <coughs> so there's no argument about that. <laughs> Number of different genes contribute to insulin resistance and most of them being obesity. Obesity itself is a genetic disorder. So modifiable factors make insulin resistant dominant. So here you have lifestyle intervention. Does it last? Can it prevent diabetes? All of us know this. You have enough number of clinical trials to quote that yes, it works. Does it work in the real world setting? Yes, it is. this study shows you that it is feasible even in the primary health care. And then that these interventions significantly reduce the growing burden of diabetes. What about long term efficacy of lifestyle intervention to reduce insulin resistance and insulin resistance syndrome? You have evidence for that as well. And it works. And then why do you target insulin resistance? Because you are killing three birds with one stone. You are taking care of obesity, you are taking care of cardiac disease. And it helps other conditions as well. So, how it works, I don't have to tell you. Lifestyle measures, reduction of oxidative stress, inflammatory markers. So, what does that mean? The conclusion is that it doesn't matter which came first, but which is dominant. And the conclusion is that most patients with diabetes are obese. Vast majority of people with diabetes are insulin resistant. I have shown you it is not almost 92%. Insulin resistance precedes all events in the pathogenesis of diabetes by several years. All the prevention trials and strategies target insulin resistance. You take any of the studies, they have used troglitazone, they have used so many other drugs have been used, they have used metformin, everywhere sensitizers are being used. Why? Because insulin resistance is something you can deal with, it is dominant, you can reduce it. And that is the reason that all prevention trials use sensitizers. And not only that, it is important for you to understand that a sensitizer is used throughout the course of the disease. You don't withdraw metformin any time during the course of the disease. It's still there. It's there in the beginning. It's there at the end. Insulin resistance can be modified. Beta cell genetic defect always existed. But the epidemic of diabetes is explained only by an increase in insulin resistance. Our forefathers had the same genes. But why is there more diabetes now? Because insulin resistance has increased because lifestyle has changed. So beta cell defect may be the final determinant. I don't want more to debate on that at all. But insulin resistance is the dominant determinant. Every bad gene, even if it's a gene for beta cell defect, does not translate into disease. But it's the triggering event which proves to be dominant. Because unless you pull the trigger, the person is not going to die. And that is what I am showing you here. 
Vita said defect is there. The gun may be loaded. I don't say no to that. But if you have to pull the trigger, the environment is there, the person involved is there. Unless he pulls the trigger, insulin resistance doesn't happen and diabetes does not happen. So I rest my case here. Over to you, Bhavna.